بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد صادق الأمين رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنأمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Friends, guests, brothers and sisters, educators, homeschoolers, people with a passion for education and people, I hope all of you, who see a vision of the future um, that is not bleak, but we hope that is hopeful. My name is Abdurrahman Malik, and I'm going to be the MC for tonight's event. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Ihya Productions, Darul Islam Foundation, the Zaytuna Institute, and the Muslim Students Association at the University of Toronto, I would like to welcome all of you here tonight. It is a great honor, and indeed a great pleasure to see all of you here in all your diversity and uh, and passion, we hope, for the subject at hand. Tonight's talk has been entitled Beyond Schooling, Building Communities Where Learning Really Matters. We are here tonight, ladies and gentlemen and friends, to talk about an issue that is constantly on the pages of our newspapers. If we are parents and teachers, it is constantly on our minds because of the children that we teach or the children that are our own. If we are people in society, then this should be an issue that should be burning straight to the heart of our civic responsibility and our desire to see a world that is better than it is today. Education has been the touchstone of debate for decades and will certainly continue to be so. We live in a province where education is changing so rapidly that teachers like myself are left in a whirlwind and in a lurch. Education in this province is moving so rapidly towards a destination which many of us simply do not agree with. Because if we like it or not, we live in a world where schools almost seem that we can't do without them. But tonight we are going to be talking about a vision of education perhaps where we can transcend the institution of school. The purpose of tonight's event was to bring together Muslims and non-Muslims, to bring together people with different interests in education, to bring together the general public in a, listening to a spirited talk about the future of education. Clearly, for those of us who are in teaching, people like myself who are history and drama teachers or elementary teachers, we believe that there is a better way. There is a better way to teach our children. There is a better way to educate the hearts and the minds of young men and women who are going to go out and create the world that we hope and desire for. We believe that education takes place within communities, dynamic communities, communities where citizenship and civic responsibility are paramount, communities where people care for each other, communities that are merciful, communities that are tolerant, communities that are diverse. We believe that the home and the community is the place where this work of education is done, not simply in the four walls of a school. Some of us might think that this is perhaps radical. Some of us might think that perhaps this is something newfangled. I want to begin tonight in a perhaps a little unusual place, and I'm going to hand it over to Mr. John Taylor Gatto. Canada has produced some really remarkable personalities, and one personality who doesn't get a lot of airtime, and one who's very rarely studied, even on the university campuses, is a man by the name of F.R. Scott. F.R. Scott was a social democrat, a constitutional lawyer, and one of the early pioneers of the social justice movement in Canada. In the 1940s, F.R. Scott wrote a poem which for his time would have been scandalous, and it was called The Examiner. And before I introduce Mr. John Taylor Gatto, I want to read this poem called The Examiner by Mr. F.R. Scott. The Examiner. The routine trickery of the examination baffles these hot and discouraged youths. Driven by they know not what external pressure, they pour their hated self-analysis through the nib of confession onto the accusatory page. I, who have plotted their immediate downfall, I am entrusted with the divine categories, A, B, C, D, and the hell of F, the parade of prize and the back door of pass, in the tight silence, standing by a green grass window, watching the fertile earth 
graduate its sons with more compassion, not commanding the shape of stem and stamen, bringing the trees to pass by shift of sunlight and increase of rain, for each seed the whole soil, for the inner life the environment receptive and contributory. I shudder at the narrow frames of our textbook schools in which we plant our so various seedlings. Each brick-walled barracks, cut into numbered rooms, blackboarded, ties the venturing shoot to the master stick, the screw-desk rows of lads and girls, subdued in the shade of an adult, their acid subsoil, shape the new to the old in the ashen garden. Shall we, shall we open the whole skylight of thought to these tiptoe minds, bring them our frontier worlds and the boundless uplands of art for their field of growth? Or shall we pass them the chosen poems with the footnotes, ring the bell on their thoughts, period their play, make laws for averages and plans for means, print one history book for a whole province, and let 90,000 read page 10 by Tuesday? Sounds like Ontario. As I gather the inadequate paper evidence, I hear across the neat campus lawn the professional mower's drone clipping the inch-high grass. F.R. Scott paints a bleak picture of schooling, but let's not take F.R. Scott's word for it. It is my pleasure and my honor on behalf of my community, the Muslim community, to introduce and to welcome Mr. John Taylor Gatto. Mr. John Taylor Gatto was a public school educator for 30 years in the city of New York. He taught in the elite public schools and he taught in the schools that no one else would teach at. He supply taught. He was in many different grades and levels served on various committees. Mr. Gatto's work in the public schools of New York was so recognized by his peers and by the administration under which he worked that he was named New York City Teacher of the Year several times. And then, in a last hurrah, was named New York State Teacher of the Year. Mr. Gatto is indeed one of the most celebrated educators in North America. But in a quite a strange turn, and perhaps not so strange after you hear him, Mr. Gatto left public education over a decade ago to pursue a thorough investigation of the purpose and the history of schooling. And Mr. Gatto, for us, for many young educators like myself, represents a fresh voice. I can remember the first time when I opened his seminal work, The Seven Lesson School Teacher, and having an interest in education and being at a faculty of education, I read it. And by the end of it, I was, I was like struck by a lightning bolt. There was such truth and honesty in what he had to say. And it has been our dream for many years to have him on the stage here in Toronto, speaking to the Muslim community and to the community at large. Mr. Gatto tonight is going to be addressing an important topic. He's going to be talking about communities where learning doesn't really matter. To set up the stage for our next speaker, Sheikh Hamza Youssef. Without any further ado, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. John Taylor Gatto. I'm, I must tell you that the sweetest sound to a 70-year-old man who's about 80 pounds overweight is to hear himself described as a fresh voice. <laughs> uh, I, I have two brief apologies to make to you before I begin. Uh, about a week ago, I backed into a tree and... Uh, knocked my lower teeth loose, so if you have some difficulty with my accent placing it, it's bad driving. That's the accent. Uh, and the second apology is that I'm going to work from a script, and I do that for your own protection, because if I begin to ad-lib, who knows? We'll have to lock the doors. You'll never get out of here. I'm, I'm reading from the latest work that I've been doing, researching the history and background of forced schooling or compulsory schooling, which is really an identity between Canada and the United States. They're quite similar, even though there are local differences. And the architects of Canadian schooling, the architects of U.S. schooling, were, were in fact closely allied with one another. 
The man from whom I first got wind of the real purpose of American schooling was James Bryant Conant, a Mayflower descendant and one of the influential Americans of the 20th century. I'll get to what those purposes are in a little while, but first we have to do some groundwork together, beginning with the matter of boredom. When I was a boy, my granddad told me that bored people are childish people, so not to ever say aloud that I was bored. He said that the obligation to enlighten myself and amuse myself could never be passed off as anybody else's responsibility but my own. And in the area where I grew up, in western Pennsylvania, around Pittsburgh, I can honestly say, no matter how radical it sounds, that not once did I ever hear a companion or an enemy utter the expression, I'm bored. I didn't hear that said, although I knew the dictionary definition, till I got to New York City, where everybody said, I'm bored all the time, every day. I couldn't escape the expression. On that basis, that we're responsible for our own amusement and enlightenment, American secondary schools, North American secondary schools, can fairly be called childish places because they are places of exquisite boredom. Think of school as we have evolved it in the past hundred years, as a laboratory of extended childishness. Then think of the possibility that this might have been done for some rational purpose. As significant as the boredom of young people in schools is, the fact is that teachers in these institutions are bored too. They might not so readily admit it, but boredom is the common condition of school teachers, their low energy, their dispirited speech, and often their whining is the giveaway. If you ask school kids, as I often did, why they feel bored, they always give the same few answers. They say that the work is stupid, that it makes no sense, or that they already know it. They say they want to be doing something real, not just sitting around. The teachers themselves don't seem to know much, and in any case, clearly aren't interested in what they teach. And when you ask teachers why they are bored, they say it's the kids' fault. They say that kids are rude, that they aren't interested in anything except grades, so how can a teacher be interested in them? It's a catch-22, you see. When you look at schools closely, you gradually become aware what childish places they are, how many kids and even teachers are held prisoners there in a childhood they would willingly have left long ago if they knew how and if the institution had enabled them to escape. Before I continue, let me define my subject here a bit further. Think of a continuum from childlike, that's what we expect young children to be, innocent, trusting, respectful, obedient, anxious to please, and then go all the way across to childish. The palette of childish characteristics includes selfishness, irresponsibility, boredom, envy, inconsiderate behavior, whining, and in general, a lack of emotional proportion and self-discipline. Childish people need to be attended by adults. That's important, so don't forget it, because it will come in handy in a few minutes. It's an important clue to what's really going on. Now contrast that childlike to childish continuum with another familiar word, youthful which offers quite a positive window on human character. Youthful means adventurous, energetic, curious, resilient, indomitable, surprising, open to new experience. Very few schools I've ever seen could possibly contain, let alone encourage, youthfulness. 
I hope you recognize the paradox in that, an institutional structure which finds itself compelled to suppress those very qualities which are universally acknowledged to be passports of success in Western society. Obviously, we're in the presence of some greater interest or interests which need protection against full self-development on the part of too many to explain rationally why, why we have the schools we do. Put simply, they can't be the way they are unless it serves some purpose or purposes. They are not expensive accidents. Remember, rationality and reasonableness are two different things. Surely it isn't hard to make the case that our schools are unreasonable by discouraging the ingredients of youthfulness, but that's a far cry from saying they're irrational. You'll see what I mean a little more clearly as we proceed. How many of you knew that secondary school was hardly the only path to maturity until World War II? Junior high school didn't even exist until well into the 20th century, and high school was only a minor part of society until the second quarter of the same century. Now maybe you think that's progress, but how do you factor this little detail in? Did you know that even today in wealthy Switzerland, less than one kid in four goes beyond elementary school? Shall I repeat that? In the richest nation in the world per capita, less than one kid in four goes beyond elementary school. You wouldn't be likely to know that because North America's responsible newspapers, magazines, and media outlets, and education schools don't bother to tell you that. And that's a big paradox, wouldn't you agree? For most of our history, kids did not go to secondary school, at least most kids didn't, yet the unschooled rose to be admirals like Farragut, inventors like Edison, captains of industry like Carnegie and Rockefeller, presidents like Washington and Lincoln, writers like Melville, or scholars like Margaret Mead, who never saw the inside of a schoolroom. People who re reached age 13 were not looked upon as children. Ariel Durant, who, who co-wrote the well-known History of the World sold by Book of the Month Club, which I guess some of you own because they use it as a premium, was married at 13 to the man she stayed married to for more than 50 years. Would she really have been better off doing junior high school homework than starting her life? Was her husband, Will Durant, some form of sexual pervert? Or is there something left out of the story that we've been sold about the proper role of 13-year-olds? If we had a successful system of education before we had universal forced schooling, as the examples of Lincoln, Carnegie, and Margaret Mead suggest, why were these training grounds in boredom that we call forced schooling demanded as a replacement for it? It's a puzzle, but as we track childlike, childish, and boring schools to their origins, we find ourselves back in time about two centuries in the northern European nation of Prussia. By 1820, Prussia was teaching the world that schools could be training grounds for obedient political subjects. I'll just step away from the 
script for a minute to say that the three traditional purposes of schooling, wherever it's appeared around the world, still seem reasonable to most people if you present them with the case. The first purpose we could call the religious purpose, to make good people, but in fact there are systems to approach that in the secular world as well. The second purpose is to make good citizens, people that will shoulder the burden of the community, act as leaders, take on responsibility for other people. And the third purpose is that your individual God-given gifts can be developed, can be enhanced in this protected environment. Purpose one, purpose two, purpose three. Nothing about creating obedient political subjects, which is the fourth purpose of schooling, and that's the, uh, that's the subject of the film I'm trying to make about the history of schooling. It's called the fourth purpose, and if any of you have a, a yen to get on my website, it's just my name with .com at the end of it, and you can read about that film. Anyway, Prussia was teaching the world that schools could be training grounds to be obedient political subjects and that the mechanism to perform this magic was not surprisingly habit training, sensitizing children to be reflexively responsible to propaganda. How well this scheme worked to concentrate state power in that little poor nation up against the North Sea, the world was soon to learn in three titanic Prussian wars between 1871 and 1945. I say Prussian wars because Prussia eventually swallowed all of Germany. Beyond its war-enhancing ability, Prussian habit control schools served the emerging mass production business empires just coming into being as dominant factors in national economies. German psychology early saw that the school could condition children to be susceptible to any sort of authoritarian appeals, including the soft core authoritarianisms of advertising and public relations. If that were true, then Adam Smith's implacable laws of supply and demand could be repudiated. For if demand could be created for anything or any idea, a managerial revolution was at hand, one which freed managers, including politicians who were, after all, social managers, freed them from a slavish inquiry and dependence upon public opinion. Public opinion could be what management made it. And for any of you here who are students of, of uh, business, of marketing, you know that marketing really means overcoming sales resistance. This can be done by saying, hey, you've got a flat tire and I'll sell you a good tire to replace it, but can also be done by saying that set of apparently good tires you have in your car is horrible and it's socially degrading and you can buy these tires that have a, a white stripe around the wheel and upgrade your social status. Now, if you think that's an absurd story about tires, I want you to think about sneakers for children that cost $150, even though they're made of exactly the same materials in the same factories as the sneakers that are made for $10 for children. And the only difference is the Air Jordan logo on the side and maybe a slight difference in styling. That's from, so this is a major idea I'm presenting to you, and it was a major idea when it occurred to businessmen, big businessmen, not merchants, big businessmen, that they didn't have to wait for a demand that they could take whatever supply was easily at hand or cheapest at hand and peddle it by psychological means. Thus, from the very beginning, the founders of compulsory schooling 
aimed at collectivizing and socializing the ordinary population through the inculcation of habits of dependency. In simpler terms, they work to extend childhood beyond its natural limits by arranging the removal of young people from home and neighborhood surroundings and their placement with total strangers, false kin, as it were, unknown to parents. And to deepen the bewildering estrangement, these strangers were themselves under the comprehensive direction of faraway strangers, completely hidden from public view, from whose decisions there was no appeal. I hope that the Latinate phrasing doesn't conceal from you that I'm talking about the fact that your local principal takes his orders, he thinks, from the local superintendent, but the local superintendent full well knows that he's taking his orders from somewhere else. He's not quite sure where. It might be the Carnegie Foundation. It might be from the government or from its agency assigned to schooling. And if you go into the government and the agencies assigned to schooling, you find out that they're taking their orders from somewhere else, and they're not quite sure where, but they do know that key politicians will punish them if these orders aren't followed. And so we get into the rarefied realm of political control, but that will save for another talk. So as I told you at the start, I first got wind of the real purposes of American schooling from James Bryant Conant, president of Harvard University for 30 years, an inner circle manager of the atomic bomb project during World War II, high commissioner of the American zone in occupied Germany after the war. And shortly after the war, this Mr. Conant began to produce a stream of books about schools and society. I would have no doubt that in the university library, all of those books, and there are a great many, are available. Conan is often credited with being the principal legitimatizer of gargantuan high school plants, those anonymous warehouses of two to 5,000 students like Columbine in Littleton, Colorado. In a book published in 1949, bearing the title, The Child, the Parent, and the State, I mean, there's a title to roll around inside your mouth, The Child, the Parent, and the State. Conant mentioned in passing that a coup had given us modern schooling. He didn't bother to elaborate on the details of that coup. He simply stated that a coup had given us modern schooling. So if you have a professor or a relative who said, did you listen to a conspiracy talk in, in Convocation Hall tonight, you say, well, this fellow Gatto says that the president of Harvard said that in a book called The Child, the Parent, and the State. Excuse my ironic tone. Uh, anyone interested in the details of this coup, Conan said, could read a book called Principles of Secondary Education, printed in 1918, to find out what the details were. That slight reference aroused my curiosity because I had been in a classroom about 26 years and I was ready to find out what kind of a coup had given us this instrument that I was serving. But I was frustrated because no library I went to had the book listed, not even the Columbia University Library, and that was frustrating. So I settled for looking up the author of the book instead. Now, if you keep in mind that the president of Harvard had claimed in public print that this fellow, his name was Alexander Inglis, held the key to a coup which explains modern compulsion schooling, I hope you'll be as interested in Inglis's background as I was. 
It seems that Inglis was the descendant of a prominent American family highly sympathetic to the British side in America's revolution. One of his ancestors was the rector of New York City's famous Trinity Church. That's an Anglican parish representing the uh, elite of the official state religion of Britain. And that particular English was working tirelessly at the time of the revolution to bring about a state religion in the United States. For reasons best known to himself, he fled from George Washington's advancing army. Another English wrote a refutation of common sense. Now, for the young out there, you may not recognize the allusion to a book which is widely credited as being one of the, the fuses that led directly to the American Revolution. Uh, Paine wrote a stirring call to revolt against England and that English who wrote the refutation was paid off by being named the first Anglican bishop of Nova Scotia. If you'll be patient with me to lay in this background, when I come to tell you what English says the purposes of schooling are, you'll see that you're not in the hands of a conspiracy theorist, but somebody quite important. And still another of English's relatives was the commanding general of the British forces at the siege of Lucknow in India during the Sepoy Uprising in 1857. He was promoted to major general for his gallantry in the face of the rebellious Sepoy wretches. And I'll tell you one last fact about English. If you ever attend the honor lecture in education at Harvard University, ever since 1926, it has been called the English Lecture. And now we'll get to the six purposes of schooling according to Dr. Inglis. School was intended on this continent to be as it had been in northern Germany, a fifth column into the burgeoning libertarian condition where disenfranchised and oppressed groups were clamoring for some kind of seat at the bargaining table. School was to be a surgical incision into which the class-based management theories of England were to be inserted to interdict the liberty traditions. England's multi-layered social class is simply a modern day representation of Julius Caesar's advice that when you're overwhelmed by the enemy, you divide them and conquer them that way by setting them against each other. The method was to be by infiltration into the minds of children out of sight of their parents. The well-read here won't, won't be shocked. Theorists from Plato to Rousseau to Frederick of Prussia knew and taught explicitly that if children could be kept childish beyond its term in nature, if they could be cloistered in a society of children without any real responsibility except obedience, if their inner lives could be attenuated by removing the insights of history, literature, philosophy, economics, religion, if the imminence of death and the certainty of pain and loss can be removed from daily consciousness, if the profound reflections on one's own death could be replaced with the trivializing emotions of greed, envy, jealousy, and fear, young people would grow older, but they would never grow up, and a great enduring problem of supervision would be solved. For who can argue against the truth that childish and childlike people are far easier to manage than critically trained, self-reliant ones? And now you're ready to hear the six purposes of modern schooling taken directly from Dr. Inglis's book. The first function of schooling is adjustive. Schools are to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. 
That's fixed habits of reaction. Notice that this precludes critical judgment completely. Notice, too, that requiring obedience to stupid orders is a much better test of function one than following sensible orders ever could be. You don't know whether people are reflexively obedient unless they'll march right off the cliff. Second is the diagnostic function. School is to determine each student's proper social role, logging the evidence mathematically and anecdotally on cumulative records. You probably thought that that the kid or parents or neighbors or the region circumstances. No, the school is to determine your proper social role and they're to fix you in that role mathematically on their cumulative records. Next comes the sorting function. School sorts children by training individuals only so far as their likely destination in the social machine, not one step beyond. Keep in mind, you're not listening to John Gatto. You're listening to the man for whom the honor lecture in education at Harvard is named. The fourth function is conformity. As much as possible, kids are to be made alike. Whatever the background they come from, they're to be made a lie. This is not done from any passion for egalitarian ideals, but so that their future behavior will be mathematically predictable in service to market research and government research. Next comes the hygienic function. This one's my favorite. This has nothing to do with individual health, but it has a lot to do with the health of the race, at least as Inglis or Darwin or his first cousin Galton saw it. Hygiene is a polite way of saying that school is expected to accelerate natural selection by tagging the unfit so clearly, that's what all those little humiliations from first grade on, that's what all the posted list of ranked grades are about, so clearly that the unfit will drop from the reproduction sweepstakes, either in despair or because their likely mates will have accepted the school's judgment of them as terminally inferior. And last, Last comes a fancy Latin word, the propiedutic function. That's a fancy word meaning that a small fraction of lucky kids will quietly be taught how to take over management of this continuing project. Guardians of a population deliberately dumbed down and rendered childlike in order that government and economic life can be managed with a minimum of hassle. It's that low down, nitty gritty, common purpose. Not Marx's grand warfare between classes and greedy uh, uh, captains of industry. It's simply so that management will have a minimum of hassles. Now, it's one thing to say you're going to do all those things and another to actually do them. What, for instance, would the mechanism look like which could reduce people to a state where they would be compliant in such an arrangement? While Britain and Germany had conditioned their own populations for centuries to accept paternalistic direction from the political state, it hadn't happened to anywhere near that degree in North America. And a project of this magnitude could not just be rammed down citizens' throats. They would have to be taught to actually welcome it increment by increment. If any of you have read Orwell's 1984, it was necessary before you could get rid of Winston Smith to compel him to love Big Brother because if you were forced to execute him, 
hating Big Brother, you wouldn't know how many more Winstons were out there. So you had to adjust his mind. Now, in this system, if at any point public outrage became too loud, the scheme's managers were instructed to retract it a bit and wait until under cover of some national emergency like war or any other civil unrest, it could be sent racing forward again while people were looking elsewhere. That is how the formidable United States' ability to read and argue was deconstructed during the drums and tramplings of World War II. The plan, simplified mightily for the purposes of this talk, called for the infantilization of North America, the gradual dumbing down, the gradual demoralization, the slow, steady removal of critical responsibilities from families and their transfer to bureaucrats. What I'm talking about here is a radical extension of childhood, principally through schooling at first, but in time through every institution, including and especially popular entertainment under direction of a small elite. Popular entertainment, of course, removes the necessity to entertain oneself. But once again, we need to reiterate that childishness it is not an objectionable quality to management, but rather its very justification for being. Childish people are unable to offer effective resistance to management. They may whine, complain, even shoot one another, but they have no idea how things work. So eventually they come to heal or break. Childish people, for all the noise they can make, are nearly helpless. They fall back in line because they have no other choice. They lack the inner resources to be self-sustaining. Through the second half of the 19th century, beginning in the North German states of Prussia, Saxony, and Hanover, a science of making young people childish grew up. It was studied by certain prominent Americans like Horace Mann, William Torrey Harris, the Peabody family, J.P. Morgan in Canada by Edgerton and Ryerson, and by others who envied the control it offered to management and wanted that control for themselves. With the rise of the centralized corporate economy a quarter century after the Civil War, another overriding reason to place the population under tight management arose. But before I tell you about that one, which is big time, we need to get a few red herrings out of the way. At the same time this project was going, other groups, other groups besides businessmen and political leaders, had reasons to advocate against intellectual education and education in personal competence. Utopian socialists like Robert Owen and John Ruskin thought that through an endless childhood, an agrarian utopia could be achieved. The evolutionary crowd like Darwin, Galton, and Herbert Spencer thought that most of us were biologically retarded and couldn't grow up, so we had to be cared for. It would only make trouble to allow people to try to grow up. Scientific historians like Hegel or Herder and Marx thought that by keeping people dumb and incomplete, history itself could finally be controlled by small elites and guided to a conclusion. There were others too, but we don't need to review them all here. I, I wanted you to know that there were plenty of potent interests around that wanted the public childish, but none of them had any resources. None of them had the resources of corporations to sustain a campaign in that direction. For a long time, 
It only required a little corporate financing done behind the scenes to allow an army of innocent academic and philosophical screwballs to do the corporate government bidding unknowingly, thinking they were riding their own hobby horses. I personally was put on the trail of radically extended childhood paid for by business uh, by reading the works of a man named Elwood Cumberley, who was a friend of Dr. Conan at Harvard. And he was Alexander Inglis's partner at Houghton Mifflin, the publisher, where he edited the elementary school series of textbooks while Inglis managed the secondary series. Houghton Mifflin, if I pronounce that correctly, and if I don't, my apologies to the Houghton and Mifflin family, they had a monopoly on books about institutional schooling. If you wanted to read about supervision or financing or classroom technique, you bought a book from the Houghton Mifflin series for several decades, the key decades, when the institution was brand new. Coverley was also dean of teacher education at Stanford University. And while there, he became head of a thing called the Education Trust, a shadowy cabal of academics nationwide who controlled every major administrative post in America by 1918. Once again, my source of this information is no conspiracy book. It's the very conservative graduate education school textbook called Managers of Virtue by David Tyack, T-Y-A-C-K, a well-respected volume that's been in print for years. All the administrative jobs in North America were under the control of a group that called itself the Education Trust until the newspapers got wind of it, and then they submarined into a new... Uh, in 1906, Kibber Cumberly had written in his Ph.D. thesis at Columbia Teachers College that in the new school's coming, this is a direct quote, children are to be shaped and fashioned like nails, and the specifications will come from business and government in that order. If you're skeptical, and I encourage skepticism, I guess the librarian at this university can borrow Coverley's PhD thesis fairly easily so that you can read these words for yourself. Specifications, of course, the word is a term for outcomes desired, and how those outcomes were to be reached was up to academics and bureaucrats who worked for the policy people. It's a strategy that in business is known as management by objectives. You say, I want you to be in this place at this time. I don't care how you get there. A few years later, in 1919, the same Elwood Coverley was writing, the childhood had been deliberately extended by four years because a combination of powerful interests had demanded this. The trick was pulled off by denying children association with the adult world and with real responsibility through comprehensive confinement schooling, which created a world of children separate from the real world. There, the little human resources could be held until summoned or not summoned. It isn't very hard to see that the interest served most directly by delaying personal sovereignty is something we can fairly call the managerial outlook. Total management and human independence are mutually contradictory terms. Once professionalized, management finds it irresistible to argue that neither children nor their parents can be trusted, that the only sensible way to handle growing up is through expert goal setting and professional interventions at public expense. What I've tried to do here in my crude way is to show you that once the institutional infrastructure is established, nobody has to know what it's about. They have to know that they don't get their paycheck 
unless they keep the system in a steady state. So that eventually all the architects who know what's going on could die off and the thing becomes a piece of autonomous social technology. It's time we all faced the fact that expert management is never well served by allowing children to grow up or to grow whole, its tutelage is only justified intellectually by the academic disciplines of psychology and sociology and anthropology and evolutionary biology, even military science, each contending in its own way that growing up is impossible for most of us. All of these disciplines grew from corporate or government underwriting regardless of how many famous leftists are associated with these particular movements, they were all paid for by corporations or government. Why? The philosophical momentum of managerialism in the West was, was in my opinion, only balked by the theology of Christianity, which expressly forbids the faithful to duck personal responsibility. And it establishes the road to salvation as a lonely personal road. You can get some assistance from being part of a congregation, but when you stand face to face with your maker, according to this theology, there are no excuses. You are fully responsible. Thus, Western religious thinking itself became a prime target of schooling, as from a pedagogical perspective, it was implacably contrarian, so it had to be systematically destroyed. Somewhat over a hundred years ago, higher academic voices in America set up a litany which communicated that however elliptical we would remain children forever, always in need of supervision and regulation. The identical message that Prussians had heard a century and more before. One recent piece of evidence that our leaders listened to the voices came to me from a press conference held by Vice President Gore's wife just a couple days before the election of 2000. In that press conference, Tipper Gore declared that 55% of the American people are mentally disturbed and in need of therapy. But Mrs. Gore isn't the only one saying that. She's one of a host of commentators that urge daily that we be kept under closer and closer surveillance for our own good, of course. When speaking to this question of general irresponsibility, observe how convenient and useful it is if classrooms are workshops of rudeness, rowdiness, and danger. Far from being something to avoid, it's something to welcome because how better can you instruct the onrushing generations that they can't trust one another and instruct their parents not to stand in the way of official ministration because look how dangerous these children are. At the end of the 20th century, approximately 100,000 American school children were being barcoded in an experiment to track their passages and see to it that each boy and girl is always where someone else thinks they belong, everything in its place, a place for everything. The profound change in the American bargain with its young, the change that dumbing them down and demoralizing them brought about, was not the result of popular demand, nor was it caused by prominent socialists like John Dewey, who were often blamed. The transformation was an undertaking, plain and simple, of industrial titans like Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, Vincent Astor, Commodore Vanderbilt, John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, and a few others. And if you find 
your skepticism rising at that statement, I suggest you ask the librarian to secure for you the two American congressional investigations of what's behind schooling. One was made in 1915. It's the Walsh Committee report. The other one in 1953 uh, is a senator from Tennessee. Sorry, the, the name eludes me. But both of these congressional reports, which are quite extensive, came to the same conclusion, that schooling is under the direction of the private corporate foundations of this handful of men I just measured. And long after their death, that oversight continues. Just watch, if you're in the education school, how often you see a reference to one or another of the Carnegie endowments, the Ford endowments, or the Rockefeller endowments. Isn't that wonderfully generous of them? But remember, these policy people were only interested in outcomes. They left the details to underlings like Henry Kissinger or Zbigniew Brzezinski. And what is that work? One way to understand it is to see, see it as a systematic recreation of the class-based, expert-driven managerial society of Anglican Britain, only this time based in supposedly objective scientific principles. You know, all those bell curves that justify locking all those children away for their own good. But why would an economic leadership co committed to Adam Smith's capitalistic principles veer in this decidedly socialistic direction? Fortunately, these men talk about it in their own essays, memoirs, letters, and occasional writings. Carnegie and Rockefeller, for instance, both despised competition because they thought it was irrational. As purely rational thinkers, they worked with might and main to stamp it out and to replace it with a planetary form of government which would resemble the British Empire and its Anglican corporate theology, only it would be better because more efficient. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the promise of unlimited energy, you know, coal and oil, which really hardly had existed before then, coupled with mass production machinery, suggested that an industrial utopia was actually within reach, but only if society could be made susceptible to a degree of management beyond any historical precedent. Personal liberty and conventional morality would have to be surrendered if this promise were to be realized. Indeed, as I told you earlier, even the law of supply and demand would be forced to yield. But how to get rid of the libertarian American past? Put yourself in the position of these visionary industrialists struggling to socialize the majority into dependence on central management. If you need a crude illustration of dependence on central management, it's you raising your hand to go to the toilet. The authority of the political state had to replace the authority of family, tradition, and religion. It was a huge task. There was nowhere else to start but with the children. So drawing on the method pioneered in Prussia, the quick arrival of young Americans at responsible maturity had to be ended. Financial capital demanded this. Now this is sort of a tricky point, so I'll try to slow down my pell-mell delivery here. Financial capital demanded this. Why would anyone make huge investments in mass production machinery, machinery that was certain to obsolete itself in a couple of years, unless the markets could be guaranteed. Unless this could be done, capital would not be forthcoming and we would have an entirely different sort of economy than the one we have. That sounds like a titanic task, but assuring markets is an old game. Britain had been doing it for centuries. Competition can be muted 
a lot of ways, through trust formation, through government regulation, through government subsidies that stack the market deck, and in many ways unknown to the butcher, the baker, or the candlestick maker. But not so easy was convincing our uniquely productive population to give up its traditional yearning for independent livelihoods. The majority had to be retrained to think of itself as employees and as consumers instead of producers. A job is what someone else gives you. Otherwise, the perils of overproduction would frighten away the investment that centralized industrial growth depends upon. And so, mass schooling of a compulsory nature was given its teeth between 1905 and 1915. I believe a little bit earlier than that in Canada, because Canada was often used as the testing ground for these ideas. We'd see how much resistance, uh, uh, I believe it's Bruce Cooper's uh, The Making of the Educational State, written by a Canadian about the Canadian experience that will tell you how vigorously can Canadians resisted this and how the army was called out frequently to shove it down their throats. I guess that's much different than the usual story you hear that a grateful populace welcomed these people like maybe like the Americans marching into Paris after World War II. I don't think that happened. And so mass schooling of a compulsory nature was given its teeth. No longer was it charged with fashioning good people or good citizens. Now it was directed, exactly as it had been in northern Germany, to the inculcation of habits, fears, appetites, and attitudes useful to management. That's all you need to know to understand what standardized testing is. That is all you need to know. It measures nothing else. Keep in mind that this scheme was never intended to be destructive, just the reverse. By converting Americans into specialized economic and social functions, into incompletely human human beings, this nation the United States, but Canada also eventually achieved the most reliable domestic market in the world. The human mutilations of schooling are a trade-off for this prosperity. Comfort and security are achieved at the price of personal sovereignty. That's what makes extended childhood a paradox. Give it up and the society would enter a zone of great turbulence, the resolution of which nobody can predict. Once you see its logic, the mechanisms of forced schooling are fairly simple to avoid. And now, in my strange Pittsburgh manner, I'll get to something positive here, because by knowing and seeing clearly this negative foundation, you can, in fact, contradict it point by point. Once you see the logic, it's fairly simple to avoid. Well-schooled people are trained to reflexively obey strangers' commands and to continually seek the judgment of strangers. That's how A's are distributed. Later on, after the school game is over, advertising and advocacy journalism, paid for by advertisers, slips easily into the role of school teacher. Well-schooled people have a low threshold of boredom. They need constant novelty to feel alive. With only the flimsiest inner life, they must stay in touch with official voices through television, radio, internet, cell phone, commercial music, and other commercial entertainments, pop journalism, and shallow friendships exchanged on a regular basis. One thing I would always tell young people would ask me, how do you avoid some marrying some turkey? I said, well, one of the things you can do is find out who the person's friends are. And think, this is hardly very profound advice. And if all their friends are new and yet they're 25 years old, 
you might wonder how they've passed through all the earlier phases of friends and not carried any of them with you. Changing classes at short intervals is a drill to prepare kids for changing associates, domiciles, mates, and possessions in dizzying and eternal profusion. A climate of low-level dissatisfaction is the very air that a mass production economy must breathe. I mean, God forbid that any of you would fall in love with a pair of shoes like my father did and wear them for 25 years. You're meant to be bored instantly with what you buy or very shortly afterward or terrified into thinking that that computer that you struggled for a year to set up in your, on your desk is now hopelessly out of date and will do more harm for you. So hurry and work more and buy another one which will be replaced reliably in the next six months to a year. Uh, Well-schooled people must be poorly trained in history, philosophy, economics, literature, poetry, music, art, theology, in anything known through history to develop a personal inner life. Well-schooled people need lifelong tutelage, cradle-to-grave schooling to make any sense of their days. Mass entertainment and mass journalism provide that tutelage long after school is done. Over a century ago, great industrialists with the help of academics and politicians set out to rewrite the laws of supply and demand. They knew that if centralized producers learned to create demand for whatever could be produced most efficiently, the moral world could be turned upside down and those dogs at the top could bark there forever. The problem of succession, which doomed Rome and every other empire in human history to date, would finally have found its solution. Thus, schoolrooms became laboratories of experimentation on young minds, research centers of scientific management. To be quit of this school nightmare demands first that we wake up to what our schools have evolved into. They are servants of corporate business and big government management. If you seek a change in schooling, you're going to first have to repudiate that fatal belief you have that if only government could be given more control or only business, then all would sort itself out. In the United States, Mr. Nader was right. Both political parties work to exactly the same ends. There will be no relief from that quarter, from leapfrogging political parties. Another repudiation you're going to have to make is that you must begin to regard modern North America as neither a democracy or a republic. It is clearly an empire careening out of control, bent on projecting its own domestic controls to the entire planet. Now, what to do about this personally? Learn to be a saboteur of this thing. Throw sand in the gears of the machine wherever you can. There is no way to reform it. It does exactly what it was designed to do. Recognize the paradox of extended childhood, the blessings that it brings to managers while it curses your children, the prosperity it invests the economy with by converting spirits destined for independence into whining, greedy, bored children who define themselves by what they consume. That prize is too contemptible to be worth the cost when you next find yourself appalled by the infantile and irresponsible behavior you see all around you. Think of school as its forge and try to do something personally about it. Now, if you'd like to follow these arguments further, I have a 310,000-word book out at the book table. It's prior to the actual publication, so not many people have seen it. 
yet, and it's it's although it's priced in American dollars. If any of you would like to own it, you can have it for the Canadian dollar uh, equivalent. So it says thirty dollars American, but it's thirty dollars Canadian for today only. Don't tell anyone else I said that. Also, if you'd like to know what other projects uh, I'm working on with some other people, go to my website, johntaylorgatto.com, and, uh, and we'll be glad to hear from you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Gatto. I was almost speechless. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a dizzying tale that Mr. John Taylor Gatto has given us, a tale that I know for some of you is going to be hard to follow. It's a tough pill to follow. It's a, it's a bitter story to hear. And I'm so glad that he's talked about skepticism because I think, in fact, when we do dig beneath the surface, what he says will find great truth in our own research. But as we have a saying that Sheikh Hamza often uses, let the dogs bark because the caravan is leaving and we have places to go. So the dogs that Mr. Gatto alluded to who are barking up the tree of compulsory schooling can continue to bark because we have an antidote to this dilemma. In fact, we have many antidotes and some of them appeared in front of you earlier today we had six fine men and women who represented real, tried, true alternatives. We had um, a representative here from the Ontario Federation of Teaching Parents, uh, and we'd like to welcome, actually, all the members of the Ontario Federation for Teaching Parents who are here tonight. They've set up a wonderful display outside. These are really courageous men and women and young children and families who are taking education into their own hands, and I hope all of you will take an opportunity to visit their wonderful booth outside and, and speak to their, some of their really fine representatives. We had representatives here from the Montessori tradition, from the Waldorf tradition, from the Sidwell Friends Quaker tradition, and also from our own Islamic traditions. Our next speaker tonight is uh, not a stranger to most of you. He has come to Toronto many times, and every time he comes, mashallah, the community comes to listen to him. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf hails from California. He is presently the director of the Zaytuna Institute for Traditional Learning. Sheikh Hamza has himself had an incredible array of educational experiences that have taken him through private schools in the United States, that took him through universities in the Middle East, and finally took him to the place which he this morning told us was really a place where education was happening in the wilds of the Sahara Desert with men and women who were really committed to learning and living in communities of love and peace and tolerance together. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf has, since his return to North America several years ago, dedicated his life. And, mashallah, there are many young men and women, older men and women, who too have committed their lives to creating educational alternatives within the Islamic ethos that reflect many of the values that John ended his talk on. Today, the Zaytuna Institute and many other organizations, including Dar al-Islam Foundation, Ihya Productions, and others, organize programs at a grassroots level to bring different methods of education that find their heart and soul in the tradition of our particular faith a reality, deen intensives, rehlas, junior deen intensives, and Arabic programs that seek to reconnect members of the Muslim community with their tradition. In many ways, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf is our version of John Taylor Ghetto. Tonight, he's going to be following for where Mr. Ghetto left off. And just in the same way as Mr. Ghetto has given us that picture, we hope to take the next step. 
What do we do about it? Where do we go from here? What is, is there a vision that we can all share, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, as citizens of the same land and of the same country? Is there a vision that we can develop together that sees learning as something that really matters, that educates the heart and the mind, that creates dynamic citizens, that takes us to that vision of a, of a good society that we all hope and pray that our children will have? Without any further ado, it is my great honor and pleasure to... Um, introduce to you my teacher, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaykum. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, prayers and peace be upon all of the prophets and upon our Messenger Prophet Muhammad. First of all, I want to say that uh, one of the benefits for me about hearing what I just heard from somebody uh, of not considerably but an older age than I'm at and more life experience and, and more teaching experience can come to the conclusions that I came to, which makes me realize that I might not be crazy after all. And that in itself, I think, is one of the benefits of hearing an alternative perspective, is that what you surprisingly find is that there are actually many people out there that are having these same inklings. Something's wrong. Something's wrong with the present situation, the condition that we're in. And I think the primary reason for that is the extraordinary factor that is never placed into their equation, which is the human soul. This is not in the social engineer's equation. And I think the, the thing that sums it up best, there was a book written by a man named Crosby about his basic thesis was that the the incredible control that has taken place in the last 500 years is based on the ability to measure things that human beings have, 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 have obtained a power of measurement. They can measure the air. They can measure the ocean. They can measure the stratosphere. And measurement gives you power. In fact, the Arabic word to measure and to have power is the same word. But one of the verses in the Qur'an says, مَا قَدُّرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They didn't measure God. They didn't measure God. He's not in the equation. And one of the things that we see that is so prominent in modern society is the attempt to remove the sacred. Whether it be Christian, Sanctity, whether it be Islamic, whether it be any type of vision of a sacred world, it is removed and when it is included, it's included in a way that takes the teeth out of it. It's included in a way that makes it an object of study, as in anthropology. We can look at the quaint natives the quaint beliefs that they held. I took a course in, in the university called Magic, Religion, and Science. And you can see from the order where they were taking you. In other words, we lived in a magical period where people believed that there were gods up on Mount Olympus and they did extraordinary things and then we moved to the religious period, a little more rationalism, introducing uh, elements that the intellect could share, but still retaining fragments of that previous period, that period, the, 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 the magical period. So the belief in angels, despite the fact that every culture on this planet has some concept of the angelic realm, uh, coincidence, that every plant, every culture on this planet has some concept of the demonic realm. 
And every traditional culture on this planet has some concept of the sacred realm. But these are our remnants. And then the religious period was superseded by the rational scientific period. And then the religious person becomes irrational. As if irrationality was not part of the human makeup. Human beings have irrational elements. Why do you fall in love? Is there anything rational about falling in love? And yet a large part of my life has been affected by the fact that I fell in love with a woman. And it was a completely irrational event. I couldn't tell you why it happened. I couldn't even tell you how it happened. But it happened and, and I've got some children running around as a result. It was irrational. But it was one of the best things that I ever did. So we do do irrational things. And we shouldn't be ashamed of those irrational things that we do if there's some type of satisfaction that comes out of it. If there's some meaningful event, if there's some purpose if it fulfills something necessary to our humanity, to our being, then we cannot say it's irrational. But what becomes irrational is a society that claims to be the most rational society on the planet, and yet it has the most irrational premises at its foundation. The premise that human beings can be controlled. The human being is a loose cannon on this planet. And, and we have to thank God for that. The human being is unpredictable. The human being will do things because he's told he can't do them. Because it's impossible. And sometimes, because he was told he can't do it, he does something extraordinary or she does something extraordinary that changes the world for the better and sometimes for the worse. And that's being human as well. The ability to make human mistakes. There are people now who would say, what do we do? We've got this system. What John Taylor Gatto just said, it would seem as he, he's saying, throw the whole thing out. And we're told there's no turning back the clock. You can't go against progress. There are people that will say that. They'll say, this is human progress. You can't go against progress. And yet, one has to question the intelligence of somebody who recognizes that they've made a wrong turn down the wrong road and it's taking them to the wrong destination and they see a sign. You see, you're going to a place called Paradise, South Dakota. And you turn on the wrong fork and suddenly it says, Hell, Arizona. <laughs> you have to question the sanity of that person to not turn his car around and head back to where he made that mistake. Because that's a sign of intelligence to make a mistake and to rectify the mistake that you've made. And if you can't do that, then you're stupid. And, and those are the people that are supposed to get the F's. Really, we have to question a society now of lemmings headed for a precipice and nobody is saying stop. And the people that are saying stop are called radicals, are called extremists. A lot of people don't realize that some of the greatest, most celebrated people in these so-called universities, these higher centers of learning, were radicals in their time. Some of them were killed because of their ideas, burnt at the stake, put under house arrest. And then we can honor them. Like they used to say, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. That's what the Americans used to say. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. Well, now 
you can have Hollywood films in which Geronimo's the hero. He's the hero. The bad guys are these, these stupid white guys. We can do that now, but woe unto Geronimo when he was calling his people to rebel against control. A free people. A free people. Look at the southwestern Indians. I want to take one example. The Anastasi Indians. They lived in a place, there's a place now called Chaco Canyon. Chaco Canyon, nobody knows what it is. But there was a woman, she's an anthropologist who also happened to be uh, an astronomer. And she was one day examining some glyphs up on a hill, on, on a rock, a mesa, that overlooked this, this site of these Native Americans. They weren't called Native Americans when they were living there. They got that title later. I've never understood why uh, the Aboriginal peoples of America have accepted that idea of being a Native American. And some haven't, but some do, and it, it always intrigued me that. But they weren't, they obviously weren't called that then. This woman was up on this rock, and she was looking at this glyph. It was a circle, and it had a spiral that looked, oddly enough, like what we now know as a galaxy. Galaxies are spirals. You always, uh, you see these pictures from the Hubble telescopes of these spirals, and, and you wonder about order. Why is it a spiral? I mean, why do you see that in a seashell? That same spiral down here on planet Earth. That What is that in nature? Uh, the secularist word for the divine. What is it that in nature that, that likes spirals? In fact, our whole bodies are spirals. It's called a double helix. It's everywhere. So she was looking at this and suddenly there was a flash of light that went right through this spiral from the rock. And she looked back and there was a slight sliver in rocks that had been placed there. And she thought, what's today? And she realized it was the equinox. And she realized that she was actually seeing the zenith point. And she said, is this some kind of astronomical glyph? So she began to study it, not no longer as an anthropologist, but now as an astronomer, which is, we have to ask, how, how do these coincidences happen? <laughs> you have to wonder. I mean, one of the fascinating things for me to, in, in my travels around the world is to, to ponder the fact that you've got six billion people, according to the control paradigm's latest Estimate. I don't know. Who know? Who has anybody gone and counted six billion people? <laughs> but anyway, they extrapolate somehow uh, in that mystical science called statistics, which I actually got an A in, and I can't remember a whole lot. I remembered a bell curve and a few other things about that, but which is part of the plan. You can take those classes, do very well in them, and they don't serve you very well later on down the road. So. Six billion people, each one of them has a bestseller if they could just write it down in good language. Every single person on this planet that's reached any age of maturity has a best-selling novel of their life if they could just write it down in good language. And the amazing thing about it is those other five uh, billion, nine hundred million or 99, whatever. Those, those other, they're all in that novel somehow. They're, they're either, uh, they're either supporting actors or small time parts or extras. And each one of them has that going on. In other words, we have a cosmic event of incredible complexity going on here, which is the fact that each one of you is the center of the universe. Each human being in this room is the center of the universe. And right now, I just happen to be uh, part of your experience. 
Each one of you. I'm just part of your experience. I'm going to leave and you go back to your lives. And hopefully they're changed for, for the better a little bit or we've learned something or we go out to, to make some changes. But we have an extraordinary uh, event going on here and it took place in that moment, in that mesa, where this woman, an astronomer who happened to be a, a, a anthropologist studying these people, saw this flash of light. She happened to be up there at the right time in the right place and she had the right tools to understand what she had just witnessed. So they began to study this Chaco Canyon as an astro astronomical site. And what they found out was, was the entire place was aligned, not just to the sunrise and the sunset, to the equinox, the shadows all reach certain corners in this building and the moonrise, and there was the glyph work to determine moonrise and sunrise, to determine moonset and sunset at different times of the year. And one of the equations would take 18 years to work out. These were uh, ignorant Native Americans, ignorant Native Americans, savages. Savages. So they, they asked these anthropologists to say, what was this place? What did it mean? They're saying, well, we don't really know. We, we don't know what it was, but it, they definitely knew something amazing. They had very high astronomical and geometrical sciences to work all of this out. They asked a Native American from the Hopi Indians, no degree, no diploma, had, in fact, they just said Native American. That was his qualifications to be interviewed. <laughs> and he was a simple looking guy there with it. He's, they asked him, what do you think this place was? He said, you know what this place was? He said, these people were people that looked into the heavens and they saw order. And they wanted to bring a portion of that order down to earth. That's what they saw. They looked up in, into the heavens and saw order. We used to say in this culture, before it was taken over, as in heaven, as above, so below. As above, so below. The idea that we live in an orderly universe, an ethical universe. One of my favorite statements ever by a theologian in the history of theology is Kierkegaard's statement in which he said if every human being on earth was led into heaven and only one man was condemned to hell and I was that man then from the depths of the abyss of hell I would declare the eternal justice of God. That's what these people were looking at. They were looking at a just universe, a universe of purpose, not an eloquent dance to nowhere as a leading anthropologist at Harvard University called Life on Earth. An eloquent dance to nowhere. A meaningless, random event of extraordinarily complex coincidences. Billions of them that happened to come together at the right time in the right moment to make this event. Why is there something as opposed to nothing? I was in a, 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 an observatory and we, I took my boys to see uh, this planetary, it was at an, a planetarium and you saw the stars and we looked up at this dome and here's how it began. Suddenly there was just a flash. And suddenly you were in this, all those swirls again. And the man said, in the beginning there was the Big Bang. <laughs> That's literally what he said. The Big Bang didn't happen in any one place. It happened everywhere at the same time. And you know what my boys said? Subhanallah. <laughs> because they knew who did that. Children know that. 
One of the deens, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi said, if you take a rock and you look at a two-year-old and you hide behind a wall and you throw the rock over his head, the two-year-old will turn around and if he can't walk, he'll crawl over to investigate where the rock came from. Why can't that two-year-old just believe it popped out of nowhere? <laughs> Why can't it do that? Why can't that two-year-old just simply believe that it popped out of nowhere? Because inherent in human nature is the belief that there, for every effect there is a cause. For every effect there is a cause. And it starts right from the beginning. And we're told that there was no cause. We're told everything on this planet has a cause except the universe. There was no cause. Everything else has a material cause. You study any of the physical sciences and they'll tell you there was a cause. They'll even, if you study physiology, they'll tell you about form and function. That every single thing in your body is designed for a function. The form is actually designed for the function. And they talk about design, they use that word. And I always wondered about that because I would ask them, who's the designer? Natural selection. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about this character? Because there's intelligent design. So is natural selection intelligent? Well, he works a lot at it. He makes a lot of mistakes. But he improves each time. Well, that's intelligence. I mean, that's a lot more intelligent than a lot of human beings that I know. Right? Because Einstein said the definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Which is what we call school reform. Really, that, that's what it is. It's school reform. So we want, we want to look up at the stars again. They've, they've done their best to take them out of the sky. They keep artificializing California. Fortunately, the power, we're losing it all. So one day the San Franciscans are going to walk out and say, my God, who created that? They haven't seen the heavens in, in at least 30 or 40 years. There's kids there that don't even know that there's stars up there. And they don't know that the sun shows up every morning. There's a lot of, I'm serious, there's a lot of these people that are so disconnected to this universe that they're not even aware that there's a thing called the solar system. Again, a system. You wonder about that system. That's an engineer's term. Right? Systems. Who makes systems? You can't blame that one on natural selection. The solar system. Because natural selection working here on Earth. Who, who got that one going, right? I mean, really, there's questions here to be asked. These are called the big questions, but they're left out of those multiple choice tests. <laughs> Somebody once had the, I, you know this guy, he's called the telephone man, and this is a true story. He was a telephone man in a yellow book, and I was in a bookstore, Cody's bookstore in Berkeley. And he came up to me, and there was a camera there. And he said, I'm the telephone book, and I can help you find what you're looking for. And apparently it's a commercial, and you get $50 just for doing it. So he asked me, what are you looking for? And I said, actually, I was in this section. It's called phenomenology. And I don't think it's in the phone book. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 you'd be surprised. I'm, I'm really serious. He said, you'd be surprised. He's looking it up. How do you spell that? P-H-E. He looked it up. He said, it's not in here. And I said, you know, God's not in there. Right? God's not in there. I mean, the big things aren't in the phone book. You can't look them up in the phone book. And that's the truth. It doesn't have all the answers, all these manuals they give you. How to do this and how to do that. They don't teach you how to nurture your soul. But they're very good at destroying the soul. And, and what we need to do as a community, all of us together, is we need to wage, we need to wage, I don't want to use war because when Muslims say war, they get in trouble. 
But we need, we need to wage, I'll use Brian Wilson's term, we need to wage unconditional peace <laughs> against a, a, a culture controlled by a handful of people. And people say, well, that's that, are you saying there's a conspiracy? I'm saying that you don't hang around long enough after the movie to read the credits. There's no conspiracy about who made the film. You just saw a film, and that film had an agenda. And if you didn't stay long enough, you'll often miss what the agenda was. For instance, there was a film called Executive Decision with Steven Seagal and Kirk something or other and a whole bunch of other famous people that people go and see just because their names are in there. They don't care what the movie's about, but they go to see those people. This film was about uh, terrorists, Muslim terrorists, taking over an airplane. And interestingly enough, the white guy who goes to save the plane is using a plane that can latch onto another plane, which, which was actually a Pentagon project that was canned by Congress. And the Pentagon was upset about this. So he latches onto the plane, and then a whole bunch of minorities are under his command, and they go in to take over and get these Arabs... Uh, out of there, who are going to blow up the entire East Coast. How they got that baggage onto that plane is another story. <laughs> but that's Hollywood. So the interesting thing about this is at, if you stay till the end of the credits, at the very end, not at the beginning, after Steven Seagal and all those characters and the producer and this, they said, we'd like to thank the United States Air Force. We'd like to thank the United States Navy. We'd like to thank the, the Secretary of Defense for making this film possible. That's an agenda. And those people who didn't say long enough to see the credits don't realize that they were being affected by what they saw. There's propaganda there. You can, everything that John Taylor Gatto told you, you can find in public libraries, the Library of Congress, or you can get it through interlibrary loan. Some of them you'll have a very hard time finding, and I'm really serious about this. I tried to find a book called The Evil Eye. It took me two years. And the book was about a lot of studies that were done about television. This man's premise was that he felt that there was a lot of brain uh, mind control going on in television, but it's, it's a fascinating book to see the studies of what they knew back in the 50s uh, about the, the, the severe effects that television were having on people. So where do we go beyond schooling? What do we do as, as people? We are human beings here together in this, in this auditorium. And we're here because we have a sense, I hope, of the importance of, of what we, we have going on here. We're human beings. Some of us have children. I have children. I'm concerned about my children. I'm concerned about the world they're growing up in. I'm concerned about the commodification of human beings. I'm concerned about human resources. I don't like... One of these guys that went and shot this place up, he, he killed all these people in the human resource office. Because they wouldn't give him a month's in advance pay so that he could buy Christmas presents for his children. Now, to imagine the stress that this man was under to actually, because he was denied that month in advance pay by the human resources, to go and do something that tragic, because it is tragic, but the entire system is tragic. What produced that man is tragic. I lived in the Saharan Desert. They don't have mass murderers. They don't have children shooting their fathers. They don't have children going to school and shooting their fellow children. They wouldn't even think of it. It wouldn't even occur to their mind or their heart. They're not more human than we are. They're not less human than we are. They're human beings, but they're in an environment in which their minds have not been manipulated and controlled to the degree to which they're going berserk. They're running amok. Look at these, uh, this last killing. And I have a map here of the school killings, which is interesting because they're all over the country. I mean, it's almost, it's amazing how they're just, 
You know, one happens here, then here, and then here. And these are, these are tragic events beyond belief. But if you look at these characters, when you see their pictures, the same glazed look in the eye. Those boys, you saw that picture of that boy in, in San Diego? He doesn't know what he did. He doesn't know why he did it. Our Prophet Muhammad said one of the signs of the end of time. He said, The killer will not know why he's killing, and the one being killed will not know why he is being killed. It's a hadith in Sahih Muslim. The killer will not know why he's killing. And the one being killed will not know why he's being killed. What is going on? What has brought us to that point? We have lost community. We've lost family. These things have been taken away from people and they weren't taken with ease. People fought. Read history. Read what happened a hundred years ago in the United States of America. What the farmers did. Now you look at the farms in, in America, the highest rate of suicide is in farmers in the United States of America. They're committing suicide. When I was a child, we, we used to sing a song. Old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. And on his farm he had a cow. E-I-E-I-O. And what did the cow do? It went moo moo. Old MacDonald had his farm taken away from him because he couldn't pay the bank. His cow doesn't go moo moo anymore because he's got foot and mouth disease or mad cow's disease. Really? And old McDonald's has been replaced by McDonald's. That's who replaced him. That's who bought the family farm. And he's gonna genetically altify, uh, alter the corn that you're eating. He's gonna genetically alter the food that you're eating in the health food stores in the United States, they have to put out things that say, we cannot guarantee the absence of genetically modified food in our foods. And if you have an ounce of intelligence to think that this ignoramus that we call homo sapien can improve, can improve on perfection, can improve on the God-given seed, the seed of life. If you believe that man, this is called hubris in the ancient Greeks, this is what destroys man, is his arrogance, his belief that he can do things that he is not qualified to do, and the sign of an intelligent man is to know his limits. To know his limits. Really, we have to question what is going on out there and our silence is complicity. The silent one is complicit in the crime. If you stand by and watch a crime happening, you're part of that crime. You're aiding and abetting that crime if you don't do something about it. The Arabs say, the Hadith says, As-sukut alamatu rida. Silence is the sign of contentment. Silence is the sign of contentment. We should be standing up. The Europeans went out and marched in large numbers to prevent genetically modified food. And yet, no, these things, people aren't even debating these things because we have an educational system that makes us docile, that makes us think like the, the John Taylor Gatto said, it makes people accept orders even if they're stupid. It makes them accept. There's people that... You, I, there was an old lady in England and she was pouring tea. She had her cream there. And as she was pouring it, she said, you know something very strange about this cream. When I was young, I remember cream going off really fast. But this cream doesn't go off anymore. It'll last two weeks. My grandfather said he had an orchard. And he used to tell us, if we found a worm in the apple, he said, I wouldn't eat an apple a worm wouldn't eat. <laughs> Seriously, think about that, people. I don't want to eat a tomato that doesn't bruise. You go into supermarkets now, and I, you think you're in a science fiction movie. The colors are different. Where are they getting apples like that? I don't remember apples that looked like that when I, I didn't remember strawberries like that. 
Seriously, you think this is what's happening? You're watching this thing happening before your eyes. We need to wake up and take our lives back. And the first thing that you can do, the most empowering thing that you can do is take your children out of this system. Protect them at least for the first 10 years. At least for 10 years. Don't be afraid to educate them in your homes. You can do it and they'll do it themselves. And they will surprise you at how intelligent they are. And you'll see that light in their eyes. It won't go out after two or three years of public schooling. It'll still be there, that bright eye. You'll see that child still loves you. It isn't listening to the children at school telling them how much they hate their parents. And there are some children in school that they do hate their parents. They beat their children. They do terrible things to their children. And your children are listening to that. And with peer pressure, they start hating their parents. They start contributing to the, the dialogue. My mom's so stupid. My dad's so stupid. You know what he made me do? Children in, in West Africa don't do that. They couldn't imagine saying that their parent was stupid. A child couldn't imagine that. The Arabian prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, once said to his companions, never curse your parents. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, how could we curse our parents? It wasn't even in their frame of reference. Now look at the subtlety of this meaning. He said, by cursing another man's parents, you cause them to curse your parents. So don't curse another man's parents. But look how he began it. Don't curse your parents. By cursing another man's parents, you cause them to curse your parents. Like these poor, unguided uh, Afghani uh, people that just blew up this Buddha that's been there for 1,500 years. The greatest Muslims in the history of Islam were living in Afghanistan. And before that, some of the greatest Buddhists. Balkh was a center of Buddhist learning. Many of those scholars became Muslims and actually contributed to the development of Islamic logic. The greatest scholars never said, go blow up those statues of Buddha. But what the press will not tell you is the reason, how, what brought that about. Like those companions who asked, how could we curse our parents? How did that Buddha get destroyed? It got destroyed because for 20 years, the Afghani people have lived under the tyranny of being victims of a Cold War game played between two giants called America and Russia. A peaceful people, a proud people, a people of great dignity, a people of great strength, a people that, that are praised in the literature of the English for their tenacity. One of the prime ministers said in, in parliament, how can we defeat a people? Speaking of the Afghanis, when they look down our barrels, they see the gates of paradise. How do we defeat those people? The midwife, an educated Afghani woman, a physician, Arifa Azad, a beautiful Afghani woman, educated, erudite, knew her poetry, knew her culture, was proud to be an Afghani. She was the obstetrician of my family. She couldn't go back to her country. She came to this country to learn medicine, to go back and practice medicine in her country, and the war broke out. She was not ashamed of her people. She was proud of her people. She was a literate person. People don't talk about that because history is in a vacuum. History is what CNN tells you. That's not history. That's what happened yesterday or today, whatever the latest headline news is. It's told without any context. It's told without any ability for people to analyze and look at what's happened. This is what people are given. Read history. Really look back. All of this is new. If you want to know a homeschool, uh, I'll give you a, a great historical example of somebody who was homeschooled. A man named Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was the Khalifa, the Caliph. He was the fourth Caliph. He was a brilliant man. He was a genius. 
He grew up in the house of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. He never went a day in school. He never spent a day in school. Not one day. Because he was in the greatest school, the school of the Prophet Muhammad. That's the sunnah for Muslims. Sunnah is the tradition of their Prophet. Their Prophet was a homeschooler. He schooled his children, Fatima. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was 12 years old, 12 years old, imagine this, he took a trip with his uncle to Syria of a month, a, a, a commerce trip, a trip as a, as a merchant, 12 years old. And look at our 12-year-olds today. Look at them. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful, really. Look at these poor kids, and they're victims, and you have to see them as victims. And we're complicit in the crime that was done against them because we're more busy making a living and we've forgotten we've already been given a life. We've been given a life by God. And your children are your wealth. Al-malu wal banun, zinatul hayat dunya Children, wealth and children are, are the, the ornaments, the embellishments of life on earth. But to sacrifice your children for your wealth. If I had to give up one of the two, I know which one I'd give up. And I don't have that much to give up. So it's a lot easier choice than it is for some people out there. <laughs> we need to retake our communities, really. You need to stop buying these uh, at, at these corporate Really, don't, don't buy from them. Don't wear the logos. Don't wear the Nike Switch. Why should you give them free advertisement if they're not going to pay you? Seriously, why, why advertise for them? Take them off their, their clothes or don't buy their clothes. Make your own clothes. People used to make their own clothes. You can buy, buy cloth. Go buy cloth. Learn how to sew. Sewing is a good thing to learn how to do. Well, I'm going to feel stupid walking around in homemade clothes. Well, who do you think made you feel stupid? The same people trying to sell you those clothes that they made that look a lot stupider than homemade clothes. We've got kids walking with pants halfway down their bottoms <laughs> with shoes that are so big. I, I can't, I don't, some of these young girls walking around, my God, how do they walk? And we know it's bad for their spines. Really, all of this, this is madness. You're not the mad one. But if you have enough sense of who you are and whose you are, you have some individuality, you have some spine, you have some courage to be different. It takes courage to be different. People ask me, every time they say, what about your children being homeschooled? What about socialization? I said, that's why we're homeschooling. For God's sakes, get that through your brains. That's why I'm homeschooling. I don't want them socialized into that madness. I, it amazes me that question always comes. What about so every single person I've ever said? What that you? That's it. I don't want my my children. There, I look out there. I see these kids the same age. They scare me. When I was a little kid, and I did some Huckleberry Finn things that I'm probably a little ashamed of. But when I was a little kid. If an adult looked at me with any type of disdain, I felt fear. I'll tell you something. I feel fear looking at these eight-year-olds. <laughs> I, I really do. And one of them broke a bottle in front of my house, and I went outside and I said to him, hey, excuse me, what are you doing? He said, what's it to you, man? <laughs> this kid was 10 years old. If I had said that when I was 10 years old in Mill Valley, California, that man would have taken off his belt and whipped me. And my mother would have thanked him for doing that. <laughs> it wasn't called child abuse in those days. Al Capone, one of the worst criminals in the history of America, according to the, the history books, was thrown out of school when he was 12 years old for punching a teacher in the mouth. Al Capone, he didn't bring a knife to school and knife his teacher. He didn't shoot him. He punched him in the mouth, and he was the worst kid on the block. Al Capone went on to have an extraordinary career in crime. 
But he was a clever fellow. He, Al, people don't realize that Al Capone probably did more for the people of Chicago than most of the multinational corporations that are centered in Chicago. He opened up soup kitchens and fed poor people that didn't. They loved him, Al Capone. You know why they got angry at him? Poor old Al, right? You know why they got angry at him? They loved Al. They really did. You can read the history. Al Capone at his trial, when they mentioned that he actually wore, they had a, somebody up there who made his underwear, homemade underwear. Al Capone was a rich guy. He wore homemade clothes. That's what rich people do. They, they, they don't, do you think rich people are buying that stuff at the Gap? <laughs> rich people have, they pay somebody to make their own clothes. <laughs> They, have, they eat organic uh, produce, right? Really, they do. They eat from homemade bowls. They don't buy mass-produced stuff. You can make your own bowls. Rich people, they, they, right? They're too busy ruining the world to make their own bowls, so they pay other people to make their own bowls. But the point is, they don't eat from mass-produced things. The wealthiest people don't. They really don't. Al Capone, when it was mentioned that he wore silk underwear, blushed. That's what the reporter said. In other words, the man had some shame in his heart. We didn't even see Clinton blush. The President of the United States, when he lied to the American people, didn't even blush. Al Capone blushed because his underwear was mentioned. When Clinton's private parts were mentioned, not his underwear, mind you, his private parts, the man didn't blush. What does that tell you about Al Capone and the President of the United States? Well, I'll tell you something. It tells me that I think Al Capone was probably a better person. Really, I think he probably had uh, something in his heart that gave him a sense of shame, despite the fact he was a horrific human being. The reason the Chicago people went against Al Capone is because he killed seven men, allegedly. Not, it wasn't the killing of the gangsters. They could care less. You know what really upset them? He had his cronies dress as policemen. That's where Al went too far. That's what really troubled them. The idea of a police officer being a mafioso. In other words, it was too much, even for the people of Chicago. Seven people. And the people of Chicago were up in arms. We have seven people being killed every hour in Chicago now. Really. I mean, look what's going on out there. And people don't, they're no longer shocked at these things. My mother told me, who grew up in the 1930s in San Francisco, California, that if a person died, it was front page news for at least a month. If a person was killed, murdered, it was front page news for at least a month. Why have we allowed this to happen? Really, something very, very wrong has happened. And, and what it is, is that your souls are dying. We're literally dying of suffocation, spiritual suffocation. Our souls are dying. And, and before the lights are out completely, I would advise all of you to reject this and to commit your lives to turning the tide. Because the danger of people that can see things another way and have the courage and the motivation to set out to change those is that very often they succeed. That's why those people are dangerous. People that can see things the way they should be and not the way they are. Those people are dangerous people. And I hope I'm a dangerous man. I really do. I hope I'm a dangerous man, and I hope all of you will commit to being dangerous people. A danger to what's wrong out there. A danger to what is wrong out there. And I'll tell you something, you can begin it. If you look in here, if the average person in here even has two children, and they raise them to break the cycle, to be different, to reject it, that can change the history of Toronto. Really, it can change the history of Toronto, and Toronto can change the history of Canada. And this is the way it begins. It begins with an understanding of the power of one, because one is the greatest number. It is the greatest number. It's God's number. It's a powerful number, and an idea can change hearts.
An idea can change hearts. And if an idea is right and it's true, it should change hearts. And if it's not, it shouldn't. But we're being bombarded by people who have the power now to inflict on us ideas that are dangerous to our hearts. And they're doing it to our children. So my advice to all of you, to all of you, is to turn off your commercial televisions. This is a first and major step in changing the conditions of your households. Turn off your... And this is an act of courage. It's an act of courage. It's the coward that um, it allows others to amuse himself. You see, and I agree wholeheartedly. I once heard somebody say that they'd never been bored in their life. And it always troubled them when they heard people say, I'm bored. Children learn boredom. I've never seen my children bored. I've never once, I've never heard them say I'm bored. I haven't heard that. I haven't seen that. Let them run around and do what they want. You put them in a classroom for eight hours a day in training and preparation to living a life of sitting behind a computer terminal for eight hours a day being bored stiff. Right? Really? And, and think that this is life. No, there are, there are alternatives out there, people. Be creative. Be creative. There's alternatives. It doesn't have to be this way. And if that's the only message that you take from tonight, it's enough. It does not have to be this way. We have the power and the ability to change. And we have to do that. We have to change. And we have to listen to our hearts. Our prophet, peace be upon him, said, Listen and take advice from your heart, even if others give you advice. What is your heart telling you about what you see out there? If it's not telling you that something's seriously wrong, then as a cardiologist, I would say your heart's dead. I'm not a cardiologist. I'm actually a cardiac nurse. So I spend a lot of time with cardiologists. And, and a cardiologist will tell you your heart's dead if, if, if it's not registering any movement. If there's nothing moving in the heart, it's dead. The physical heart and the spiritual heart. And if your heart is dead, then know like the Qur'an says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحْيَرْ أَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا God brings life to the earth after its death. And our scholars say the earth here also means the human heart. Our children's hearts can be brought back to life. It's going to take some, some serious measures. Resuscitation, sometimes defibrillation. But it can be done. They can be brought back to life because humans are amazing. They have awakenings. I had a car accident. That's what brought me out of a, a sleep that I was in. I had a very powerful car accident. And I was confronted with my own mortality. And that's why they don't want to tell you about death. They don't want to let you think about death. They want to fill your lives with empty songs. Empty. They'll replace real friends for friends on a TV sitcom that know nothing about you. They don't care whether you live or die. If you want to know if you live in a community, then somebody said the, the best way to assess that is ask yourself, will the person at the grocery store realize if you happen to drop dead today that you're no longer buying groceries there? That's how you know if you have any community whatsoever. Will the person that you buy gas from, will the person that... that does this or that for you? Will they even remember that you were a person in their life? Because that's what's been taken away from people. We need community. We need community. We are communal beings. We're beings of community. Every religious tradition, the Sangha of the Buddhists, the, the Ummah of the Muslims, the Ecclesia of the Christians, every religious tradition has a sense of community, of bringing people together. And we're difficult to be with each other. You have to set aside differences sometimes. We're hard to be together. That's part of being human. It's learning to deal with that obstinate person over there and that contrarian over there. And you could be the contrarian yourself. And they're having a hard time dealing with you. But that's what life is about. It's, a, it's about setting aside differences for a greater good. Coming together, listening to each other. I, I, we were at a poetry recital in New Mexico, and we had a spectacular night. Everybody read a poem, and we had a beautiful night at Darul Islam with all these teachers. And when, and when we finished, I said that I would just like to have a, a moment of silence, I think, or a, a prayer for all those people out there watching television right now who are deprived of the joy of human companionship, of sharing poems together, 
of sharing thoughts together. And you know what? A man came up to me after he was a teacher, and he, he was almost in tears. He said to me, when you said that, I just realized something. I've been spending the last 20 years of my life in front of a TV set every night. And this is the best time that I've had. <laughs> and it's not, don't let it happen at borders. Don't let them co-opt that. Because they'll do it. They'll tell you, come down and have a poetry thing. And we'll even give you borders poetry thing. And you can advertise us on the thing. Make your own coffee houses. Really, be, be people of creativity. Be people of creativity. And, and the, the thing I'll end on, two notes. One is, John Taylor Gatto said they want you to be docile. They want you to obey orders. And it reminded me of a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which a group of men went out, and he put one of the men as an emir over the others, which is a leader on this journey. And this man, he was probably a humorous fellow, he told his companions, see that fire? I'm commanding you to jump into the fire. And they looked at each other and they said, the whole reason we became Muslims was to save ourselves from the fire. <laughs> so we're not going to do it. He said, I'm the Amir, I'm the ruler. They said, well, let's go back and ask the Prophet of God. So they went back to the Prophet وسلم, and they told him the story. And he said, لا مخلوق في معصية الخالق. Never obey a creature if it means disobeying the Creator. Never obey a creature if it means disobeying the Creator. And I would put forth that we are in gross disobedience of natural laws, laws that are part of nature. We're in a state of disobedience and we need to atone. Really, we need to redeem ourselves. All of these things that are happening on this planet, I believe that we live in a moral universe, that, that there's reasons these things are happening. There's reasons why the ozone has a hole in it. There's reasons why the weather is no longer like it used to be. There's reasons why you don't see birds and bees anymore in many parts of, 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 of our lands. There's reasons why our forests are disappearing. There's reasons why our lakes are poison and toxic. There's reasons why our food now kills 20,000 people in the United States every year. 20,000 people. More than was killed in a year in Vietnam in their own war statistics are dying from their, their, the food they're eating. There's reasons for all these things because we're out of balance and we've forgotten what the heavens are. The heavens are order and we need to bring that order down here. And there are many ways to do that. I'm a Muslim and I'm committed to Islam, but there's people in here that have their wisdom traditions. And if those wisdom traditions are working for them, then the Qur'an says, يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَسْتُ مَعَلَى الشَّيْحِ حَتَّى تُقِيمُ التَّوْرَةُ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ O people of the book, you're not on anything until you practice your Torah, until you practice your gospel. Guidance has been given to humanity. Really, guidance has been given. And everybody agrees on certain basic things except the control paradigm out there. They're the only ones that don't agree. And the majority of people in, in, in Canada and America, the majority of people, according to the dominant paradigm statistics, believe in God, believe in an afterlife. So why aren't these things ever even discussed in our public schools? Why aren't they even discussed? So my advice to all of you really is don't obey any creatures if it means disobeying your Creator. And if you want to know what disobedience to your Creator is, the Prophet said, disobedience to the, your Creator is what doesn't feel right in your heart. Listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. I, I thank you very much and apologize for going on a little longer than I probably should have. And, and I hope that, that you do what the Qur'an tells you to do, whether you're a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or a Muslim. The Qur'an gives a beautiful piece of advice and it applies to every human being. Those who listen to what's been said and they follow the best of it. Thank you very much. Before we uh, all head out this evening, I want to thank 
I want to thank Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and John Taylor Gatto again. So a few kind of public service announcements. We, we don't want this to be just empty words, and they certainly were not empty words. We certainly don't want this to be an evening where we've just listened to something that's moved us and we don't take something away from it. As Sheikh Hamza mentioned, building coalitions and building work is difficult. For the last three days here in Toronto, starting on Wednesday and ending just this morning, 135 educators from literally around the world gathered here in Toronto to spend time with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and John Taylor Gatto. We had teachers here from as far away as Sweden and Australia, from the United Kingdom. And we sat and we talked about some of the, these pressing problems of schooling and hopefully some of the solutions. One of the things that has come out of this discussion is um, a booklet entitled Beyond Schooling, Building Communities Where Learning Does Really Matter. It's a collection of three essays, an excerpt from John's latest book, uh, original article by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and a reprint of a classic essay, a brilliant work by a woman named Dorothy Sayers. Um, this is available outside at the Ihya Productions booth um, for cost of three dollars. Um, Ihya Productions, the sponsor of tonight's program, is a non-profit organization based here in Toronto, committed to alternative educational possibilities um, for our young people in our community. Presently, we're sponsoring over five young men and women who are studying traditionally abroad and funding programs like this. So we ask you to have a look at the information that's out there. One of the sponsors of tonight's event has been a group called Darul Islam. Uh, Sheikh Hamza referred to it in his talk tonight, and I was, had the opportunity to be at that poetry reading, and I was a witness to that comment, so it brought back a flood of memories. Darul Islam, since 1977, has been involved in the work of, of building bridges between the Muslim community and the community at large in the United States, and now some of their work has come to Canada. We'd like to thank them especially for the incredible support that they have given us uh, to put this program on. Darul Islam sponsors a number of institutes for teachers who are not Muslim to give them kind of an uh, examination of Islam and to give them uh, some education in the Islamic faith that they can take back into their diverse classrooms. Dr. Muhammad Shafi, who I'm, who I'm going to call to make the closing prayer for tonight's event, the dua. Dr. Muhammad Shafi has been uh, a pioneer in the American Muslim community since the 1960s. One of the founders of the Muslim Students Association, which became the basis for many community organizations in North America. Dr. Shafi has now dedicated his life to the work of Dar al Islam, building bridges and creating a better future in this place that we live. So I would like to ask Dr. Muhammad Shafi to come forward and I would ask all of us to join in a dua, a prayer to conclude our program this evening. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. O God, the God of the universe, the God of all creatures, the God of living as well as the quickened, apparently not living, as well as all other creation. O God, we as your creation, recognize the beauty around us. We dedicate ourselves to understanding the reality that is out there, the reality of your existence, the reality of the things around, the reality of ourselves. We dedicate ourselves to liberate ourselves the way you intended us to be. O oh Allah, O oh God of all, we pledge today to not destroy our children. We pledge today to not enslave anyone. We pledge today to liberate our minds and our imagination. We pledge today to get out of under, under bondage by all corporations or governments. 
We pledge today not to put any more power into the hands of others. We pledge today only to be under your sovereignty and not of anyone. O oh God, give us the strength to fulfill these commitments. O oh God, clarify our hearts, purify our intentions, give us the strength to do what we know in our hearts is right, because you put the truth in our hearts. Ameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala wa sallim ala khair khalqihi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in.